Radio control systems are widespread nowadays because of drones and other unmanned vehicles. They are robust, uh, work in a, in a long distance, and they are simple to use. And today I'm going to explain how to get the road position of the radio control systems when using STM32 microcontrollers. So next time you can easily integrate these ready control systems into your project. So let's get started. In the market, you will find different kinds of ready control systems. And one of the key parameters of the ready control systems is number of channels. So in, in this ready control system, I have six channels. So here I can, I can move up and down, right and left. So here I have two channels. Then I have here also two channels and I have two buttons here that I can rotate. So in total, I have two plus two plus two, six channels. And also when you get this thing, you also get the transmitter, uh, the receiver, sorry. So the receiver also has six channels. So you can look at it closer. So as you see, I have six channels and the, in each channel, the, the receiver generates rectangular signal as shown in this illustration. So every channel generates, in other words, pulse with modulation signal, PWM signal. So the, the, this period is constant. However, this data cycle varies depending on the position of the, of the stick, let's say. So if I move up, this uh, duty cycle will increase. If it is in the center, I have this duty cycle. But if I push it down, we will get less duty cycle. So in other words, uh, in order to get the position of each, let's say, road of each channel, what we have to do, we just have to read PWM input signal. Or in other words, we have to identify the duty cycle of the PWM signal. And fortunately, when using STM32 microcontrollers, the timers already have this capability. So reading PWM input signals using SCM32 microcontrollers uh, is, is pretty easy. So let next, let's see how we can do that using SCM32 cube ID. Once you create a project, I hope you can manage that. We need to open this IUC file or in other words, this graphical tool. And among these um, timers, we need to choose one of the timers to read input PWM signal. So in my situation, I choose a timer two. Then we need to choose the mode. So first we need to enable the timer by choosing internal clock as the clock source. Then here we would have this option, combine the channels, and we just need to choose this PWM input on channel one. Once we do it, we would have this window to set the parameters. But I would say that we can use um, default values to read PWM input signal. We don't need to do to do any modification. But later I will I will show some of the important parameters. So using these parameters, you can optimize your code. But for a while, we can keep everything as default. Um, but we need to open these NVIC settings and we need to tick this box to enable a uh, timer uh, to global interrupts. And also don't forget to check GPIO settings. So we have this PA15. So we have this PA15. So you need to connect the output of the receiver to this GPIO pin. So once we do it, we can save the file to generate the code. 
once the code is generated we will have this uh, timer to initialization function if you choose another timer timer you would have the corresponding function to initialize then um, between these comments what we need to do we need to paste these two lines of code so here what i do i just start interrupts on on channel one and two of the timer then we have this piece of code so let me explain how this code works uh, and to do to do that let me refer to the uh, reference manual of the microcontroller so when we enable um, uh, interrupts on, on channel one and two of the timers of the timer what is happening is that these events when we have rising edge and when we have this folding edge so these events will be um, handled by time by channel one and two of the of the timer so this is kind of uh, the waveform of the input signal so every time when these events happen uh, rising and falling edges all of the signal this function a uh, callback function is in executed automatically so this function is invoked automatically so what we do here we just check whether this uh, this uh, callback happened because of channel one or channel two if it is channel one it means that we have this rising edge so the rising edge is handled by channel one of the timer uh, so this falling edge is handled by channel two so here we have channel one and and then we we what we do we read the number of ticks or in other words uh, we get capture value of channel one what it returns is the is the number of ticks that happened be between these events so let me show it so it, it returns the number of timer ticks between these events so in other words by getting this value we can get the frequency of the of the of this pwm input signal so we check whether it is zero or not so if it is it is not zero what we can do we can take this capture compare value and we can convert it to the physical unit which is the frequency of the pwm input signal so to do that i just take the system core clock and i divide by this capture compare value and i just want to point out another thing is that uh, on my clock configuration uh, you can see that the system the system clock is 80 megahertz and the frequency that the frequency of the clock that drives the timer is also 80 megahertz that's why i take the system clock frequency and i divide by the capture compare value but for example if we have let's say half of the frequency to to get the frequency of the pwm signal we have we also have to divide by two so in your case the the configuration of the clock uh, could be a bit different in that situation you just need to adapt this clock to adapt these codes to to your case so we have the frequency of the PWM signal but the most important thing is the duty cycle of the PWM signal so to read the PWM signal we have to get the number of ticks on channel 2 of the timer of course so so the capture compare value of channel 2 returns the number of ticks that happened before between these events so rising and falling so this is the duty cycle 
So if we divide this number of ticks by the whole range, we can get the duty cycle. So I get um, uh, the capture compare value of channel two, and I divide by, by this value. And then to get the percentage, I can multiply by 100. However, when using these RC um, ready controllers, the, the, the range, the change of the duty cycle is, is very small. So to get more precision, I just multiply by 1000. So that's it. Um, and also I just wanted to point out that I created these uh, global variables to, to have this country compare value, frequency and duty cycle. And, and the next step, we can just uh, debug the code and see how it works. Uh, so let's debug the code. Um, and also I forgot to mention that um, I put this um, code in, in the description, you, so you can just uh, copy and paste on your project. And also, um, don't forget to connect the receiver to your microcontroller. So the, the output signal has to be connected to PA15, or if you're using different clock, or if you're using different microcontroller, um, instead of PA15, you have to use the corresponding pin on your timer. So then what I can do, I can resume the code and also we have this frequency due to cycle. So what we can do, we can just uh, um, in real time, we can check these variables by, by we can monitor them in, in real time by using this uh, live expressions tool. So we just have to write the, the variables we want to monitor. So I resume the code, then I switch on the, the sensor, uh, the, the uh, transmitter, sorry. So then uh, we can check uh, these values. So the frequency is around 49. So I guess it's not 49, it, it's around 50 Hertz. Then I have this capture compare value and DT cycle, 349. So I guess it should be uh, 750. And also I plot the DT cycle in real time using the timeline graph. So if you don't know how to do it, you can refer to my another video where I explain all the steps to configure this timeline graph. So what I do, I just move right and left and you can see that how the values are changing. And it's pretty fast and it's working really, really well. So I prefer it. It's increasing if I push downward it is increasing. So let's look at exact values. So here the, the default value is 750, but if I push right, I get around 1000. If I push left, like reaching the limit, I have 500. So what we can do further, we can here for the duty cycle, we can subtract 750. So we, we don't, we remove this bias. So we have from 250 to minus 250. So finally, we manage it to read the stick position of the ready controllers. So next time you can easily integrate these tools into your project. For example, you can remotely wirelessly control a robot or a vehicle, or for example, you can control the light a level, for example. So you can do many other things. So your imagination is, is, is limitation, I would say. So finally, uh, I want to explain some parameters of the, of the timer. So 
you can um, optimize your code. So for the final note, I opened these parameter settings again, just to explain some configurations. So first, as you see, we have this prescaler, counter modes, counter periods. So these parameters are fundamental concepts related to the timer. So I have a separate video explaining um, some parameters like prescaler and counter periods. But if you want to get more comprehensive knowledge about the timers, about uh, the STM32 programming in general, you can refer to my introductory course on STM32 programming. So let's go further. So for PWM input channel one. So as you see, we have two channels uh, dedicated to, to read uh, PWM input signals. So the first uh, PWM um, input channel one will detect the rising edge. And then we have the rising edge direct. What it means is that uh, this channel one is directly connected to this PA15 pin. And then we have this prescalar division ratio. So let me explain this parameter. To do that, let me refer to this illustration. So imagine that we have a, a PWM frequency, PWM signal with one megahertz frequencies. We, we have this crazy frequency, one megahertz. So the, this period is one microseconds, one microseconds. So what it means is that we have a um, callback function, which is automatically e e executed uh, in every clock edges. So in, in every, one microseconds, it should run the callback function twice. So uh, what it means is that the microcontroller will be busy handling all these events and it will not have time to do other things. And it's, it's a real problem if you, if you want to uh, read high frequency. However, for the ready controller, we have a 50 hertz frequency, which is pretty slow. So for, for, for this application, you can keep the default value, but if you have an application where you have to read higher frequency, it is recommended to use this prescalar division ratio parameter. So what this uh, parameter allows us to do is to skip some events. So for example, it will just handle these events to compute the due to cycle frequency then it will just skip these events. Then at some point it, it will do the, the computation of frequency and duty cycle again. So instead of handling every um, event, it will just skip some events. However, when using the graphical tool, you cannot change it, but inside of the code, you can do it. Then we have this input filter parameter so what it does, it, it, so this input filter allows us to, pre, to estimate the frequency and due to cycle more precisely. So instead of getting just one sample, it will take several times. And based on that, it will find the, the, the precise time when these events happened. Then we have a falling edge, which is indirect. So instead of connecting to this pin, it's it's internal connection. And also we can uh, choose prescalar division ratio and input filter. So that's it for today. If you have any questions, you can leave a comment. I, will, I would be glad to answer you, answer your questions. And also you can find the source code on my Patreon page, also on my uh, community page, um, on my stepschool.com website. So thanks a lot and um, see you soon.